Hello and welcome to Glasgow's Smallest Doors Are Open. I'm Emily Malcolm, one of the Transport and Technology Curators at the Riverside Museum. Usually we welcome thousands of people a day to Riverside, but most of us haven't been able to visit for a while. If you have been, you'll know that we have a large collection of ship models, almost 700 in number, and they're always really popular with visitors. The collection is important further afield than Glasgow, however, as it's considered of international significance due to the fact that almost all of the models were built on the River Clyde or were owned by shipping companies in Glasgow. We have models of ships built all along the river, from Rutherglen in the east to Meadowside and Kelvin Hall in the city, to Govan, Partick, Lintice, Clydebank to the west, as well as Paisley, Renfrew, Greenock, Gurick and Barton, and then right down the Firth of Clyde with ships built at Ardrossan, Irvine and Ayr. This geographical range is matched by depth through time. We have models made in the late 18th century and examples of ships from every decade of the 19th and 20th centuries, even into the 21st century. Usually, you have to look at the models in glass cases from a distance. One advantage of having to present our talks digitally is that you can actually get a closer look at them. I've tried to enlarge all the interesting detail as much as I possibly can. So, let's have a look at the first of the models. This is a beautifully detailed model of a tug. Now, it's designed to be shown at exhibition and enjoyed as a lovely item in its own right. The tug was called Flying Cormorant and it was built in 1908 by Ferguson Brothers of Port Glasgow. The model has hundreds of tiny fittings. If we have a look at this section, this is the wooden deck house, which would cover the engine and boiler area of the ship. It's a beautiful little structure, which reveals a lot about its function. The engine room gets very hot, so there are six little lifting vents in the roof for ventilation. There's a little doorway for crew access, which has a tiny sliding hatch above it to give a little more headroom when going down below. Now, the whole area that's highlighted here would sit in the palm of your hand in real life. And just for interest, I counted how many individual fittings were on it. There's a total of 122 brass hinges, portholes, lifting handles, and metal spreading arcs. So if you scale that up over the whole model, you're looking at over a thousand separate fittings. If we move forward on the model, you can see that the little doors here have been painted and shadowed to look as though they're standing ajar. As if we as viewers are being tempted to go inside and have a look at what's going on. In the case of Flying Cormorant, the answer is not very much. For all that external detail, this model is just made from solid blocks of wood. But we do have models where we can cross the threshold, as it were, and have a look inside. This is a model of sister ships, Heron and Ostrich, both built by Denny's of Dumbarton in 1860 for Glasgow company g, &G Burns. Burns operated overnight services to Belfast and Liverpool, so they needed to have and to advertise passenger accommodation. This model dates to around 1860, so it's really very early for a full hull exhibition model. And it's made particularly interesting because it has cutaway sections on the port side at bow and stern. These show the different types of accommodation available on board ship first class at the stern and third class in the bow. Heron and Ostrich could carry 70 passengers and they would either pay a few shillings to travel without a berth or pay six shillings, still quite expensive, to share a bunk in the third class cabin or a little more for some additional privacy in the second class cabin. These are very simple areas of the ship but there has still been a huge amount of detail added to the model. The model makers made a big effort to show the panel's decoration of the cabins, and you can see the techniques of the fine woodworker have been used to make marquetry panels in dark and light wood. 
and each of the bunks has been decorated with red ink lining. And this is all despite the whole area being about the length of your index finger. First class passengers would obviously expect a bit more in the way of comfort, and this is visible in the model as well. This is the first class saloon, which was quite a lavish area, again with marquetry panels, carpeting, and furnished with tables and upholster sofas. The model reflects what was available in real life. Both Heron and Ostrich were praised for their saloon accommodation, particularly as it wasn't down on the lower decks of the ship, but accessible from the open air on deck and well ventilated, essential for comfortable travel. Now you would be paying 15 shillings, that's equivalent to a few hundred pounds today, for an overnight return sailing between Glasgow and Liverpool. And what you would get for that is still a shared sleeping area. There are six cabins in total in the first class section, and it's likely that each would sleep four or six, the same sort of thing as a shared cabin on a ferry today. But having access to this lovely shared space would have made all the difference. Cosy, friendly and quite luxurious with these large tables and comfortable sofas. If we look more closely at some of the details, we can again see how it was put together. If you remember, this is quite an early model, so a lot of the equipment used in model making workshops wasn't available, so a lot of the parts were completely handmade. If I zoom in on this section here, you should be able to see that the table leg and the sofa leg behind it have been carved by hand, whittled, rather than being turned on a lathe. They're quite rough and ready. And if you bear that in mind when we move to the next model, you'll be able to see how techniques advance over the next 20 years or so. We can see another lovely detail here with this little buffet sideboard at the forward end of the first class cabin. It's just the height of my pinky, but it's been very carefully made from a base section in a dark hardwood, a lighter top section, and then the upper surface of that has been painted to represent marble. In addition, there's a really charming little gilded plaster framed mirror, and all it needs is a couple of bottles of port or a decanter of whiskey to complete the picture. This is a model of a famous passenger steamer called Columba. She was built in 1879 by Jane G. Thompson of Clydebank for David McBrain, who ran services on the Firth of Clyde and the west coast of Scotland. This is one of the finest models in our collection and the workmanship is absolutely superb. This shows the bridge area in more detail and we're going to look at two main areas here. Um, I've highlighted them and zooming in on the first of them, the bridge, this literally bridges the space between the two paddle boxes and it's actually the origin of the term bridge as related to the command point of a ship. A paddle steamer captain needed a point of view of ahead and to port and starboard and a paddle steamer's deck was so flat that it had no obvious vantage point that wasn't obscured by funnels, paddle boxes or passengers milling around. So this uh, bridging structure um, was uh, added to many ships to give him a good vantage point and became um, a part of ship terminology. There's plenty of cast brass and brass wire elements here as well. We have the ship's wheel centrally with binnacle and engine room telegraph and the engine room telegraphs are repeated um, just beside the paddle boxes to port and starboard to give additional points of command. If we're counting things again, there are over 150 individual metal fittings in this bridge area alone. Um, and if we look at the centre structure in more detail, we can also see just how fine the woodwork is. So this is little deck house. We have purser's office or a captain's cabin, um, and it's really just the height of your thumb. Now, most ship models use simple blocks of wood with drawn on decoration in Indian ink for deck houses, but this is different. Can you see that it's been fabricated almost in the same way as a full size structure would have been? 
Those panels, pilasters and beadings are all individually applied and there are real glass windows fitted into real wooden frames. It's all made from boxwood, which is one of the finest grains available and it's fairly easy to work with. So you can get a convincing finish right down to a postage stamp sized louvered rent in the panel on the left and a poppy seeds sized door handle. This level of detail is continued all over the ship model. I haven't counted all the elements on the deck, but Columba could carry up to 2000 real passengers. So she needed a lot of seating. Here you can see an unusual circular bench constructed around a ventilator. This must have been quite a cosy spot on a cold day with the warm air coming up from the saloon below. Again, on less detailed models, these benches were often just solid blocks of wood with inked on legs and slats. But here, everything is constructed just like the real thing with individual slats and spaces. And I'll zoom in on a section here just so you can see that. Now, if you remember when we were looking at the hair and ostrich model, I mentioned that the legs were individually whittled. The legs on these benches are the successors technology wise as workshops took on the challenge of producing components in volume for ship models and used copy leads to produce identical, perfectly scaled wood and metal fittings. Now here's another view just aft of that circular bench. And here you get a look at Columba's main saloons below the deck. Quite a lot was written about how nice Columba was to travel on and her luxurious first class saloons, which had writing desks and comfortable couches and really all the mod cons for the 1880s. I don't have a good view looking inside the cabin. It's very hard to capture, but we can just glimpse here the real glass windows fitted with paper and card drapes and just a glimpse into the internal detailing inside the model where there's painted panelling, a painted floor covering and little wooden tables and benches, but no writing paper. Columba also had a first class ladies cabin so women could have a bit of privacy. And I think that that's what's shown here. We have these opaque painted glass windows so that when the ship's berth at the quay, nobody can peep inside. And this is really the size of a postage stamp and beautifully detailed with a sort of key decoration and um, a floral motif in the centre. Columba also had a shampooing and hairdressing establishment. So this might have been situated behind these obscured windows. Now, we're going to move forward on the model to look at the forward saloon and then come right back aft for our last view of the model. This shows the curved edge of the forward saloon and we're looking at the lovely curved frontage um, of an area that anyone could enter to buy a meal, um, shelter from the wind. And there's an additional detail here which doesn't add to the technical presentation of the model but it's a lovely and really skillful example of precision model making. It's here. This is a tiny drinking fountain of silver plated cast metal with three tiny taps and two brass cups hanging off it. Now we're just about to say goodbye to Columba but as she steams off into the distance we can enjoy the detail and quality of the decorative carving around her stern. She has her name and home port right on the transom and there's this little area of carving here just on the side of the hull. This is a lovely piece with scrolls and scallops and a tiny vignette of a sailing yacht on a choppy sea under a bright blue sky. Now for our final model, I'd like to look at another Jane G. Thompson ship from a decade or so later. This is Glen Sanex from 1892, built by Thompsons for the Glasgow and Southwestern Railway Company. 
Now they built this model to send to exhibition at the World's Columbian Exhibition in 1892, and they ended up winning one of the top prizes for it. Let's have a look at why it was considered so special. It's made to an unusual scale. One inch represents 32 inches on the real ship, instead of most models being made to one to 48. This increases the size of the model and gave the model makers a bit more room for extreme detail. Following on from that lovely decorative carving on Columba, let's start with the same thing on Glen Sanex. So here we have Glen Sanex's paddle box. It's an area that's the size of your hand from palm to fingertip, but in that small area is crammed a real wealth of the most beautiful decorative carving. The design centred around the crest of the Glasgow and South Western Railway here. And if we enlarge that, you can see that it's designed around a, a, a fastened buckled belt with three mythological staffs representing Mercury on the left for speed, Juno in the centre for trade and Neptune on the right for the sea a public statement of what the company was all about. On the right and left are animal supporters, a hunting dog on the left and a stag on the right. I'm particularly fond of the dog. There's so much character in this tiny figure and it's just the size of a piece of macaroni. It has a really jolly inquisitive look with a well-defined nose and mouth, bright eyes, and a real sense of the texture and color of its coat. Again, Glen Sanex has superb woodwork and internal detailing. And I do have some photographs of the internal detailing here. If we look more closely at this image of the main saloon, we can see coming down from the deck house is a really beautiful staircase, complete in every detail with turned balusters and the stair treads with a proper bullnose edge. And unless you have a torch or strong studio lights, these are really hidden within the model. Well, we've come to the end of the presentation today, but if you're interested in finding out more, we have our ship models and additional photographs available online in our collections navigator. We also published a full catalogue of our ship model collection last year, which has chapters detailing model making in industry for pleasure and more information about how models were used in exhibitions and in museum collections. So thanks very much for listening and I hope that we can welcome you back to Riverside very soon.